And welcome back to the Sabbatarianism podcast. My name is Justin. I have across from me, Mr. Richard Davis. Hello, Richard. Hello, Justin, and everybody else. Yeah. And to my right, Mr. Neil Saul. Hello, Mr. Neil Saul. <laughs> Hello, gentlemen. All right. So it, the feast is is over. We, we were off for the feast and, and enjoyed that. Uh, but we're ready to get back into things. And we discussed that I think we're going to start here with First Peter. Um, you guys in agreement? Is that where we want to go? Looks like that's where we are. All right. Uh, anything we want to set up on First Peter or, or these letters from Peter? No, not me. I mean, I think we'll just get into it and hear what he has to say. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, without further ado, I guess, let's get into First Peter. Richard, are you going to read? I will. All right. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, the elect, according to the foreknowledge of God and the Father, in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace be multiplied. All right. Who, who are the elect exiles of the dispersion is my, how my version points it out. Yeah, the yes. pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus. These Galatia. are the dispersed Israelites. Northern tribe. Well, as we get into it further on, that's the only people he can be talking to. We'll catch that up when we, uh, when we get there. But there is some confusion with some who have adopted the idea of these are the dispersed Christians. Bullinger, I was just, I have the Believer's Bible, and, and I was reading that from Bullinger. He's one of them that believes in that, and he, he does some good stuff, but... Well, these are Christians in the dispersion, which is, of course, at this time, would be the scattered Israel. Still scattered. You know, they were in the first, in the second chapter of Acts, they came from all these areas up to the, uh, in the Passover season, up to... Jerusalem. Jerusalem, yeah, and that's when the Holy Spirit was first given, not Passover, but the festivals, the day of Pentecost, Pentecost during right. the festivals. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, he's not talking about Christians who were later driven out historically and dispersed worldwide. He was talking about those in the Israelite dispersion who have now the four not uh, the elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and have received the Holy Spirit, and thus they are sanctified by the sprinkling of the blood of Christ. So it labels them as Christians, but they're scattered Christians in this early time. So that would have, the dispersion of the, the dysphoria at this time was scattered Israel. And, and they had been driven to the north yes. of Israel, you know, 700 B.C., yet they would have easily came back maybe not to Israel, but to these communities, which are, yes. uh, most of those are, are in, in Galatia. Uh, what's I forget the term there. Uh, Asia minor. Asia minor. Yeah. 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 So yeah. would this also be the group that the apostles were sent out to, right? When, yes. when Jesus sent them out to, yes. to the lost sheep, to the, the lost sheep of, of Israel. That. Yes. Israel. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And and it, to be sanctified in the spirit, they're they're set apart. Yeah, made holy. That means they are believers in in Jesus Christ, yeah. according to the sprinkling of His blood and setting beside the old of the holy by the Holy Spirit, and they are sanctified for obedience to God. And and you you know you get the impression, that, and I think it's true that Peter was sent. To the Israelites. Yeah, he was where, one of them sent yes. out. Right. Well, yeah, he was. Right. Yeah, Paul was sent to the Gentiles. Yes. And, you know, that's why I brought it up earlier. That mm. uh, That's why I, I firmly believe it's Israel, because that, that was uh, Peter's mission. Yes. To go to, okay. that, to, to, to the Israelites. That's a good point. Yes. Okay, verse 3. Verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an eternal, incorruptible, and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. No, not immediately when they're di di they die, but in, in their own time, in the last time where the resurrection, when the, uh, the return of Jesus Christ occurs, and we will all see that. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. There's the time period called yeah. out again. Yes. Whom, having not seen, you love. So they weren't there, you know, and didn't see Christ directly, but they have believed on him, and, and through that, you, they love him. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy, inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Now, I'll just pause there in verse 9. Receiving the end of your faith. I was going to ask why you emphasize that. Okay. It's the same terminology when somebody, those who say that uh, God's love or Jesus Christ is the end of the law. Well, that means they say the law is done away. And is he saying here that that belief in Christ does away with your faith? <laughs> That's the same <laughs> nonsense. Okay. It uh, means that's the end result. That's what your faith points to. That's a fulfillment of what your faith looks for. No, that was verse 9. Yes. Yeah. R read your version again. Receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. That's okay. what the, so, the faith is headed for. The uh, English Standard Version says obtaining the outcome of your faith. The salvation of your souls. Better translation there. That's, yeah. Yeah. that's a better interpretation of what that really means. Of this salvation, the prophets have required and searched carefully. Inquired. Oh, oh, have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the suffering of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that, not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desired to look into. That's a really interesting way he's worded all that. Yeah. The, when he's, he mentions the Spirit of Christ in them, the, yeah. the prophets had the Spirit of Christ. Yes, for, for that reason. Yeah. Verse 13, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ, as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by traditions from your fathers but with the precious blood of Christ as of the lamb without blemish and without spot now we could talk a long time about yep. that uh, because even today the churches of God anyway are still mired in a lot of the doctrines of the Pharisees 
and glorifying things and arguing about things that don't obtain the, that do not contain the real glory. It doesn't mean they're needless or pointless or not necessary. But it's the blood of Christ that redeems us. In, in verse 16, where it says, You shall be holy, for I am holy. Mm -hmm. That's uh, cited from Leviticus 11.44. And I think there's another verse, maybe 45 or 46, that it says it again. Okay. And it says down here, Leviticus 11.44, 45, and chapter 19, verse 2, and chapter 20, verse 7. There you go. So there's a lot there's of them. A lot of them, yeah. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Now you notice there it says that through him you believe in God. He gives you that understanding. He, he is truly in this time period that Peter's, uh, talking about here, the only one who opens and no man shuts and shuts and no man opens and gives understanding to anyone. That that gets back to that spirit of of Christ in them. That's right. In the prophets and, and in us, that brings us to that knowledge so we can receive the Holy Spirit. Yes. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again or begotten again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Because all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers and its flower falls away, by the word of the Lord, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And that's a Isaiah. I, okay. Is that Isaiah 28? It's Isaiah 40. 40. 6 and 8, I think it is. Okay. But this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. If indeed, in other words, the Holy Spirit is in you. Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. He's speaking of Christ here. You also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion, a chief cornerstone, elect precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. That's Isaiah 28, verse 16. Yeah. And that's a messianic prophecy. Therefore, to you who believe, he is the precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. They rejected it. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble, being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. Now, Speaking of the Jews here. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And those who did not accept him. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's in several different places. I think uh, Moses uses that terminology, a royal priesthood, holy nation, and so on. So does Revelation. Mm-hmm. But he's speaking to these people in particular, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And picking up in verse 10, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, 
but now who have obtained mercy. Now that's the one that Bullinger and others have keyed in on, saying this is Gentile converts that Peter's writing to. That's what they're honing in on right there. So maybe we can expound upon that. Okay. He has already said back in verse 1 that they're part of the dispersion. Yes. Now, as far as Peter writing this early time, there hadn't been a a Roman punishment of the, and scattering of the Christians. And these are the elect, those that are first issued the calling, and that is the Israelites first. And it's not until the time period of Acts 10 you see it open up to Gentiles. Mm-hmm. The only Israelites he can be talking to at this time or those who were once not a people of God, because about 700 years ago, they were cut off by God. So that's what he's meaning here that's in verse right. 10 is once you were not a people, but now yeah. are, but are now the people of God. Yeah. That this, this is talking about his regathering of Israel, which was prophesied first in Hosea first couple of chapters of Hosea and also in Jeremiah beginning in chapter two, where he would get regather Israel, Mm -hmm. the Northern kingdom. That's the inheritance of the Northern kingdom. And they had been cut off for 700 years. Now the Jews are just now at the time of Christ being cut off when they kill Christ. They were taken into captivity, then they came back, and and now they're getting ready to be fully cut off, because cast the, out. Yes, because they're, the transgression is being filled up with the murder of Christ. And in mm-hmm. Matthew 23, he says, you will see me no more until you acknowledge who I am. Okay, so they're cut off and put in outer darkness. But the Israelite, the heritage of Ephraim, the northern kingdom, had been scattered hundreds of years before. So these people had been grown, growing up, grown up until being offered what Christ offered them. They were cut off from God. They were not his people anymore in that legal state. Now they're being brought back by a better covenant. And hundreds of years like that. I mean, imagine 500 years ago was the 1500s. Can, can you recall any of your relatives from the 1500s? You know, I, mean, yeah. I can't. Well, uh, nor the concepts of what they believed or what right. they were taught. Exactly. These, They'd lost it all. Yeah. And they have been blinded to who they really even are, except for the few that have been preached to and have like, it. I don't know exactly who it was that the wise men that came from the east on Christ's birth. You have those who came during the days of Pentecost. This is talk, tells us in verse 1 who this is to, but these are not Gentiles. Peter was not the apostle to the Gentiles. He's speaking to Israelites who've been regathered and are called the elect to the people of God. And no, he's not He's not talking about people who never knew God. They've, he's been talking about those who've been cut off for the last uh, six to seven hundred years, according to the legal commands of the Sinai Covenant. Yeah, yet it's not impossible that they might have had knowledge that they were Israelites. They just didn't have the opportunity. Or the association with God. Or the, the association, right. And so they were reached out to by the gospel and been regathered. Their, their house was left desolate. Yes. Yeah. So this is not applying to the Jews. It's, it's, this doesn't apply to them. This is applying to Israel. The northern kingdom. The inheritance of Ephraim. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So that they're offered the regathering first as Hosea and Jeremiah and prophesied. And Ezekiel. So when it says that Peter was the apostle to the Jews, that then what you're saying is it's basically to the children of Israel. To the children of Israel, yes. And that Paul was for the Gentiles and, yes. and going out to those who had never known God. Right. But in this period of time in history, the knowledge, the historical knowledge, because of the Jews writing that history for millennia, had been or centuries had, had been to deny that the northern kingdom were even God's people anymore. 
And then, which they still do today. Yeah. And they if they were do. still God's people, they're now a part of being Jews. Yeah. Basically. Well, that's their way of doing it. Yeah. And during that first century, the words Jew and Israelite had become synonymous. Yeah. Paul said, I'm a. I'm a, a Jew, Jew, a of Jew the tribe, a of, tribe Benjamin. of Benjamin. Well, the right. tribe of Benjamin wasn't of Judah. You know, right. It become blurred historically. And you have to really keep up with those things if you go through here and you want to understand really what's happening. Peter was the apostle to the Israelites. And th- when he wrote, I think is this book right here, he lets us know that he was in Babylon at the time. Now, there are others that want to say, well, that was his code word for Rome. No, it wasn't. <laughs> That's where he was. And we're going to see, too, in the next couple of verses that uh, verse 12, he says, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. Yes. Well, he's obviously not talking to yeah, Gentiles. Why make the, <laughs> yeah. Why make the distinction there? Yeah, good point. I think we dropped off here on uh, 11. verse 11. Beloved, I beg you, as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul or spirit, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation, or when God visits them and opens their eyes. Now, obviously, he's making a contrast between these people and the Gentiles. Yeah. Right. He goes without saying. Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to governors, as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who are good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. I get the impression that he he and Paul had some contact and discussed some of these things because Paul uses similar phraseology. Yeah. Could be. As free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, and fear God and honor the king. Servants, be submissible to your masters with all fear not only to the good and gentle but also to the harsh for this is commendable if because of conscience toward god one endures grief suffering wrongfully what then credit is it is it if when you are beaten for your faults you take it patiently if you deserved it it's not to your credit it's what you deserve But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. For to this you are called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committeth no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return when he suffered. He did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live in righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For you are like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. There's a lot of uh, Isaiah 53 there. Yeah. Now, we won't take the time to go into it, but this flies in the face of this theology you hear about karma. The yin and the yang, this Eastern mystic nonsense about that comes from pantheism and those religions that believe that there's karma. You, you do good, you get good. You do bad, you get bad. You know, th- those things automatically happen in the vast existence of whatever they believe is the God. Well, Christ got what he didn't deserve, didn't he? Mm-hmm. Sure did. In fact, the very fact that Christ performed miracles was one of the biggest witnesses that that's a bunch of nonsense. Mm-hmm. That he altered what we would call the physical realm in order to accomplish things that don't work according to the nature of the so-called ethereal nothingness that people worship. I think Peter's last points here in in this chapter 
are really important. For this, for to this, you were called. Right. Because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example. So you're not called to have a life that's just joyful every day and to you be get happy. to drive a Ferrari <laughs> and whatever, right? to be happy. <laughs> uh, there, There's going to be struggle and strife mm -hmm. in the life as a as a follower of the Messiah. That's that's what Peter's saying here. And notice in verse 25, once again, this is proof of who he's talking to. For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned yep. to the shepherd. Okay. Mm -hmm. Not of people who had never known him, like the Gentiles. So that's who the northern tribe and the southern tribe knew back then. That's right. Was the Messiah. Mm -hmm. But the northern tribe, the inheritance of Ephraim was cut off many centuries before. And these people then grew up without that direct association with God that Sinai covenanted hell because God had divorced them. And now he brings them back into the better covenant as the firstborn heritage. So basically, Peter here is writing to the people that he and the other apostles went out to when they went out, when Jesus sent them out. Yes. He's writing a letter to them. To that heritage. To that heritage. Yes. Yes. Chapter 3. Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they, without a word, may be won by the conduct of their wives, when they observe their chaste conduct accompanied by fear. Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is, the very, which is very precious in the sight of God. For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, calling him Lord, not some other man. That would be wrong. Calling her husband That's Lord. right. That's right. For a woman to give that lordship to some other man in any way is wrong. Right. Shouldn't be going on. Whose daughters you are if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. Husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as a weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. And, you know, those verses there would fit very nice, yeah, nicely in with there. what Paul said mm -hmm, in Ephesians yep. 5. Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tenderhearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this that you may inherit a blessing. For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Psalms 34. He's quoting a lot of scripture here, so it makes me wonder, and I don't think we're told, but it makes me wonder if these people, his audience that he's writing to, would have had at least somewhere in their lives uh, the scriptures. Well, they would have had the, they'd have been able to go to the synagogues mm. in those areas. Yeah, Acts 15 talks about that. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Verse 13, and who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteous sake, you are blessed and do not be afraid of their threats nor be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that when they do fame you as evildoers, 
those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it's better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls were saved through water. There's also an antitype, which now saves us, baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience from God, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. There's a lot right there. Yeah, the baptism uh, symbolizes not cleaning of the body, but the cleaning of the conscience and yeah. the spirit and to change what is in us. Okay, when in verse 19, when he says mm -hmm. he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, that was during his three days and three nights or before that? It's during the days of Noah. It's what it appears, yeah. That's exactly what it is. It's in the days of Noah. The Bible clearly says he was in the grave for three days and three nights, dead, and then resurrected. And this is where, you know, we don't know much about this, but we know enough to know that there were spirits in prison during that time period, the days of Noah. We don't know what the spirit, the world, the boundaries of the spirit world and the natural world or the physical world before that. We know nothing about what went on before Noah, except what little we're told in the Bible in terms of right and wrong. Mm -hmm. We don't know much since Noah, except for what the Bible's told us, too. Yeah. And it's that's why I don't get involved in this stuff about people can tell you exactly what was going on then. It you don't know. It's uh, but we do know it says that during the days of Noah that uh, um, he he preached to those in prison who had formerly been disobedient. Yeah, that's a really interesting. And that flood was actually a type of baptism. Mm, yeah. Of the world, cleansing yeah. of the world of that evil. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourself also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. That means we, we're committed to not sinning. Our whole spirit and focus is now changed. If we're committed to Christ. After your conversion, you sh there should be a cleaning up process that's thorough. And it continues for the rest right. of your life. Every day. It's about your It doesn't mean you can't sin, so you do anything you want, and your God doesn't account it to you. I mean, yeah. don't get me off on that. <laughs> for we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. There again, making a contrast between these people yep. and Gentiles. When we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries, in regard to these, they think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. They'll give you an, they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason, the gospel was preached also to those who are dead now that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. So when he says they were, they were, the gospel was preached to even those who are dead before they died. Well, it's before they, they would be before they died or it could be referring also to those who are spiritually dead. Yeah. That they might be judged according to men in the flesh for their evil do deeds, but live according to God in the spirit. The purpose of that is to live according to God. By the end of all things, but the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. Now, you point to 
people point to that and say they the, the apostles believed that we were in the end times. Well, they were right. Yeah. And it was at hand then, and it's at hand now even more much, much more so. It, just because God's time, it says, the scriptures say God's a thousand years is, is a day to God. Well, it's only been two days in God's time since this, this was said, apparently. And that doesn't mean it's farther away or not coming. It means it's closer. And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another. A good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Notice that. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another. Don't let any man judge you, any man contain it. That's what che Paul was talking about in 1 Corinthians. And in Colossians. Don't let them cheat you of your reward. Mm -hmm. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If your reproach for the name of Christ, blessed are you. For the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed. But on your part, he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's affairs. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this manner. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. So that's where it starts. Yes. And if it begins with us first, those who are the elect, mm -hmm. the firstborn chosen, what will the end, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. Chapter 5. The elders who are among you, I exhort. Now, the elder, of course, would have been the family leaders in the congregation. Family heads. They would not be the youngers. They would be the elders. Yes. And if you had, <laughs> you would call church elders, that would be the ones that people mm -hmm. respected and been chosen for their record of service and, and God's love that were laid out by, well, some of the matters or uh, requirements are in the 18th chapter of Exodus. And then some of them are in, of them are in Paul's letters to Titus and to Timothy. Shepherds of the flock, which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, as though they can make you do anything, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of, gl crown of glory that does not fade away. I just want to pause for a minute. I think that is a very valuable text right there explaining the difference between the old overlords, the mediators, and the those that claim they're in authority over others, God's authority over you. He's saying whatever good you're doing in this overseer role is by the love you show to others and the example, not by compulsion, because you have to, because you want to, and not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as lords over them, but being examples to them, to those who really want to look up to you and want to do what's right and respect you. 
That's the best type of leadership. That is. By example. That's proper godly leadership among right. his people. And when the chief shepherd appears, you'll receive the clown, crown of glory it does not fade away. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourself to your elders. Yes, all of you, be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. By Silvanus, our faithful brother, as I consider him, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God in which you stand. She who, and he's talking about the church here, who is in Babylon, elect together with you, greets you, and so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to you all who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Mark, my son, is that John Mark? I would think it probably is. Interesting. I, I don't know for yeah. sure. There could have been others, but. But he, that shows that he was in Babylon. He was the, the uh, ap chief apostle to the Israelites. I, I agree with what Neil said earlier. There's a lot of similarities here with, with his writing and that of Paul. But and, and maybe they did talk. I don't know. But they were taught by the same person. That's yeah. for sure. Yeah. Right? And, and uh, Peter and James, too. Yeah. A lot of similarities. But Peter, in this letter seem to spend a lot of time saying, hey, count it good if you do have to suffer. You're going to suffer. Yes. You know, it, he spent a lot of time on that. Paul mentions it some, but Peter spent a lot of time uh, talking about that here. This was a really interesting, This every time I read it, it's a really interesting letter. I, I see more and more each time I go through it. Uh, any uh, final thoughts on it, Neil? No, I'm just thinking we got enough time. We may be able to get in the three chapters of Second Peter too. Well, Here's Neil's a question. being aggressive. <laughs> Here's the question: Was this the first Peter or the oh. second Peter? Well, or it's was called it just two different Peter. letters. <laughs> yeah, I think somebody told us that there were more than one Peter. I don't know what people are thinking when they make things up. Well, Richard, what do you think? Want to read this one too? Let's do it. Sure. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ. So it's the same guy. <laughs> to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust." But also, for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. 
For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I'll just pause there and say that's a good passage there, verses 5 through 10, to go through on a constant basis. How are you growing? How, how is your life progressing in these issues? Well, in the end of 1 Corinthians 13, as well as uh, faith, love, or faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love, it looked like Peter here in verse 7 built all the way up to the, the, the crescendo or, or the, the apex of it being love, agape. It, it, it's, I was just going to ask you, I bet it's agape. I'll look it up, but I'm sure of it without even looking. Well, if it's not, it should be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, a brotherly affection is, my version says, with love. So that would be more like Filia. the filial. This is agape. Yeah. Verse 12. For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of those things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Therefore, I'm just going to keep telling you over and over <laughs> Which and is what over. he's doing, yeah. yeah. And I had people say, you know, all Richard talks about is this and that and the other. Those covenants. And that's right. <laughs> Everybody's given their own gifts. Yes, I think it is right as long as I am in this tent. That means his body. Body, yeah. To stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of those things after my decease. For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. Quote, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased, end quote. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. So this isn't like Luke who's retelling a story. This no. is Peter who was he, there and heard it. Yes, he said, I heard it with my own ears. Right. And so we have the prophetic word confirm, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. But there are also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who brought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time, their judgment has not been idle and their destruction does not slumber. These are really important here. This is one of the only spots that I can think of where we're warned that I guess there are a few others, but we're warned that there's going to be people come in among you. Yes. And try and subvert things. Yes. Well, and Paul warned the Gentiles of that. True. And and uh, I, I see uh, similarities to John, First John, especially. Test the spirit. Yeah, and and that Antichrist is already among us, right. and so on. Yeah, well, the, but they didn't. Yeah, I mean, they got this from the, like the prophecies of Daniel nine. Mm -hmm. There would be an overspreading of abominations until the, the final time. There would be deceptions always, and they were looking for it. But are we looking for it? Well, we should be. We should be. That's why we should be sorting out the, the scriptures. Verse 4, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell, or the grave, and or their imprisonment, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, 
and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly and delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the ungodly out of temptation, to deliver the godly out of temptation, and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment, and especially those who walk according to the flesh and the lust of uncleanness and despise dominion or authority. They are presumptuous, self-willed. They're not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries, whereas angels who are greater in might and power do not bring a reviling accusation against them before the Lord. But these, like natural brute beasts made to be caught and destroyed, speak evil of the things they do not understand and will utterly perish in their own corruption and will receive the wages of unrighteousness as those who count it pleasure to carouse in the daytime. There are spots and blemishes carousing in their own deceptions while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin, enticing unstable souls. They have a heart trained in covetous practices and are accursed children. They have forsaken the right way and gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, that he was rebuked for his iniquity. A dumb donkey speaking with a man's <laughs> voice restrained the madness of the prophet. <laughs> These are well, wells without water, clouds carried by a tempest, for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Now, those are some very harsh words. And it talks about, it's, it's talking about being double-minded. People who want to teach and teach you and use the Bible, but they're double-minded in their will and objectives, like Balaam, but, uh, yeah, Balaam was. Well, and like the one, I believe it was in Zechariah where you quoted, where it was a shepherd herding the sheep for yes. the slaughter for his yes. own gain. Zechariah 11. For when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. So the their promise of yes, liberty. Yes. But being back into to something that doesn't equal God's will is bringing you back into bondage of sin. For if after they have escaped the pollution of the world through the knowledge of Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The latter is worse for them than the beginning, for it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known and turned from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit, and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. Man, Peter's really getting to it here. Yeah, we got that's a very straightforward word, so we have to be careful with that. Once saved, always saved, right? No. I, I, I think Peter just <laughs> uh, took that one apart. Uh, something yeah. struck me here when it, when he talked about uh, Noah. Mm -hmm. He was a preacher of righteousness. Mm -hmm. I, I've read this book before. I, I just didn't catch that. I, Preacher of righteousness. That's interesting. It's interesting. The new uh, English Standard Version uses yeah. a, a herald of righteousness. Okay. For Noah? Yeah. Okay. And, you know, that like the town crier was a herald. Mm -hmm. So he'd bring the news of the day to the people. Tell them to do what was right. Yeah, right. he would. And Noah was not only sitting there building the ship and getting made fun of, he was telling them basically repent get yeah, away from all this exactly and and uh, just before that he talked about the angels who had sinned but he cast them 
into hell. Mm -hmm. That's Tartaru. Their, their prison. It, mm -hmm. it, it's outer darkness, which he uses uh, at the end of that chapter. I yeah, believe. that's a different word than any other word that's, that's translated, translated hell. to hell. Yeah, it's not a hole in the ground. Yeah. Okay. And and you know we we call it the abyss in uh, Revelation, I think. Okay. Where the angel came down to the bottomless pit. Well, that's with the keys to it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And that's that's their their place of where they're being housed in their in their prison. That's why where that is. We don't know. Yeah. No We're, idea. Yeah. But even the the spirits though cried out to Messiah, "You're not going to send us to the abyss before the time, right?" Right. Now that was obviously meant there were some still here that were knew they were headed there at, at some that point. point. Some point, right? Now, when he mentions that, uh, I don't remember which verse that was. Uh, about Noah? No, about being in outer darkness. Uh, those who turn back from after knowing the truth. Uh, water. Okay, verse seventeen. There were waterless springs, mist driven by a storm. For them, the gloom of outer darkness has been reserved. And he's not talking. He's talking about humans there. Yeah. And when you are separated from God forever in what the world wants to call hell, that's outer darkness. Yes. And that's when there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Right. Well, there's some of that going on now, but it'll be for those. That's the end of it. Yeah. Yeah. Away from God. Yeah. You know, men trying to explain what they can't see, they use all kinds of figurative terminology. Well, they, they come to their understanding with idols in their heart, so right. they come to wrong yeah. conclusions. Right. That's right. You know, anyone, especially he's teaching here about people who come in teaching people and bringing things in. And if you're going to teach, I mean, that's anywhere from lowly people like us sitting down before this and, and saying things that other people will hear, you have to be careful that there is an absolute respect for every word of God that has ever been spoken and has been recorded. The idea that any of it has no value now is a dangerous notion. It's up to us to understand the different aspects legally of what God was re requiring of, say, ancient Israel and what he requires of us now. But the value of it in terms of its eternal value is always there. Well, and when there seems to be a, a disagreement in the scriptures, that's that's on us. We have understood something incorrectly and need to go back and study it up. Or else they're all going to make. We're not in together. agreement about it and we need to be humble in that. What do you mean? Because. Uh, for instance, I've been called opinionated <laughs> by men who I've, that I can say are some of the most opinionated people I've ever met. Yeah. Uh, it's just that none of us know everything. Oh, yeah. And what we do know, as Paul said, we didn't re that's good and right. We didn't make it up ourselves and didn't come from us. What do you know that you did not receive, he said. If you do know something that's right, then God has revealed that. It doesn't come from you. And don't think you know everything. So be ready to understand and to learn from each other and to learn from God's word rather than to argue and promote yourself. That's a double-minded man who's double-minded in his ways for self-promotion, for money, for gain. He's talking about those things right here. Yeah. You know, if we want to teach, we've got to be careful to, to respect everything that God said. And if we don't see any value in it, then there's, a diff there's something wrong with our understanding. We just need to learn to study God's word better and ask him what it was about and what it was for. Yeah. Chapter 3. Chapter 3. Beloved, I now write to you the second epistle in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder that you may be mindful of the words which are spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. That's just what I said right there, wasn't it? The holy prophets, all the words that were previously written in the law as well as the ones that are being written here, read 
he's writing down here, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the father fell, fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willing, willfully forget that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water by which the world that then existed perished being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth which are now preserved by the same word are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. To its coming again, but a different way. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to, you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God? because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Not, nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. New heavens, new earth. That's right. Same terminology as John in Revelation. That's right. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligently to be found by him in peace, without spot and blameless, and consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, is written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they also do the rest of the scriptures. Things never change, do they? <laughs> That's really important. You, therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware, lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, have it being led away with the error of the wicked, but grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. Amen. So be it. May it be so. Peter really got with it there. Uh, really interesting Interesting letters. All right, Neil, are we reading anything else today? <laughs> you want to do a two-hour podcast? No. I don't have time. I don't either. All right, gentlemen. I, on the other hand, if I go home, I might have to paint something. Yeah, so. you, you got chores, so you may want to go ahead and start reading some word. <laughs> All right, anything else you guys want to add? I, I don't believe I have anything. All right. I, really important stuff there, of course, uh, with the part about Paul at the end there. I, I think that's been well documented. People know well about that uh, within our Sabbatarian community. I wish others outside of our community knew it better. But anyway, uh, we'll pick it up next time, uh, and we'll talk to you then. Bye-bye.